Thank you very much, Sue. I really appreciate that. Uh, I, uh, as I, as you come to know, I'm from the uh, Bay State Sleep Medicine Department. I work over there as a sleep specialist. Uh, and today, uh, the most important thing that we will talk about uh, is uh, what are the importance of sleep and what is uh, how to develop uh, healthy sleep and uh, what are the risk factors that are uh, we can recognize for poor sleep and how to ask for help when we see those risk, poor, risk factors for poor sleep. In order to understand that, we have to have some understanding for sleep, and we'll be talking about that. And there are certain sleep disorders which play a significant role in regards to our sleep, and uh, that is insomnia, uh, restless leg syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, narcolepsy, and currently the COVID-19 that we are dealing with right now, uh, which has an impact on its sleep. So we will be talking about all those things today and give you an overview in regards to how important our sleep is all about. Uh, so let's start with the impact of sleep on our health. Um, according to the National Sleep Foundation, uh, anyone who's sleeping less than six hours, any adult, is highly likely to develop problems with such as diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, obesity, and stroke as compared to individual who is sleeping less, who is sleeping seven to nine hours. So definitely it has an impact on our health, our mood. Our mood is also impacted by sleep. Uh, research, research has informed us that uh, people who are having lack of sleep have 10 times more likely to develop clinical depression and 17 times more likely to develop anxiety. This is a data coming from National Sleep Foundation. Sleep also has an impact in regards to our performance. According to the National um, Occupational and Environmental Medicine Journal, uh, poor sleep contribute towards loss of productivity, and it can cost employers approximately nearly $2,000 per employee per year, actually. So that entails that it is impacting our health, our mood, and our performance. And let's not forget about our safety. Sleep has an impact on our safety also. And according to the National Highway Safety data, uh, according to the statistics in 2017, there were 91,000 uh, police reported crashes which involved drowsy driving. And that takes me to the uh, message that I want to share with you guys, which is safety comes first. And I'm going to play a video over here in order to emphasize the fact how our sleepy driving would be consequential to our safety. So I'm gonna play the video to share with you to get the message across that, how important it is to have a good sleep so that you don't end up having uh, a drowsy, becoming a drowsy driver impact your safety actually. So here we go. Driver tiredness and fatigue is a killer on our roads. Too many rollover crashes and head-on collisions are caused by drivers falling asleep behind the wheel. Signs of driver tiredness include struggling to keep the eyes open, yawning frequently, and slow reaction times. A tired driver may also wander across the centre line and drift across other lanes over road markings or follow other vehicles too closely and have trouble remembering the last few kilometres. Stop and rest before it is too late. There is no quick fix or miracle remedy. Our bodies simply need to rest. Most adults need a minimum of six hours of sleep per night. When we don't get enough sleep, our brain cells do not communicate effectively, which in turn affects our visual perception, physical reflexes and memory. For your own safety, always start your journey refreshed and well rested. To remain alert and focused behind the steering wheel, plan your journey and your rest stops. After two hours behind the steering wheel or every 200 kilometers, find a safe spot and take a break from driving. Stop, refresh your body and mind before continuing your journey. Let's share roads safely and responsibly. Visit the website arrivealive.co.za for more information on road safety and preventing driver tiredness. 
for me and for everyone to be safe on the road for us and for everyone else is really important. So safety comes first. So I wanted to share this with you because we take it for granted. And uh, in this life and uh, the kind of life that we live in right now, our, our lives are driven by our work and our life by our responsibility. But being safe driver also reduces the risk of ourselves and to other people on the road. So I wanted to share this with you in order to make sure to emphasize the, uh, the importance of sleep and safety driving, actually. So let's go and uh, 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 talk about uh, as far as the how many how many hours are needed uh, as far as sleep is concerned. Uh, as far as uh, how many hours are needed uh, as far as the sleep is concerned. So as we tend to age, our sleep requirement differ. If you see a newborn, a newborn would be having um, approximately requirement of 14 to 17 hours for their sleep. As we tend to age, our requirement to go to sleep start to go down. Um, as far as a healthy young male adult requires seven to nine hours of sleep. And as we age above 65 and above, seven to eight hours is average amount of hours of sleep. So this is the most common question that I see. I've been asked, oh, how many hours do I need to sleep? So it's an average. Uh, not everyone is exactly the same number. It can vary from well, one number to another number, but this gives you a frame of reference that this is the ideal amount of time that would require to refresh yourself. So as a young adult male, it's around seven to nine hours. And after age 65, the sleep requirement slightly goes down to seven to eight. Whereas as a newborn, as uh, you would see them that they're sleeping a lot. And the reason is that because they're, they're making their own networks in regards to their brain when they're sleeping. So that's why there is a variability between the time of the sleep when you are young. And as we tend to age, the requirement of sleep becomes lesser and uh, becomes around the age of uh, 65 is around seven to eight hours. So keeping in this mind, uh, how sleep impacts our brain. So they, uh, German and co did a study. What they did, they collected two sets of patients, one who were having regular normal hours of sleep, seven to eight hours of sleep. And then they took another group, which were sleep deprived for 35 hours. And what they did, they asked them to do an arithmetic question to figure out how the brain would react if, the, if they're sleep deprived. As you can see the imaging on your left-hand side, which is normal sleep, uh, when they did the arithmetic questions, this is the normal lightning of their brain uh, when they were solving the questions. Whereas the patients were the group who were sleep deprived, when they were imaged uh, after 35 hours, their performance was also very low. And the reason is that the areas of the brain that were lightening up were really poor. So this shows that sleep has an impact how we process information. Sleep impacts how we assimilate information. So uh, having a proper good hour of sleep or number of hours sleep impacts in regards to our performance. So this uh, study actually shows a direct imaging impact of how sleep is impacting our brain. So how is sleep is structured. It's really critical to understand how our, our sleep is structured. Sleep is governed by two processes in our body, which are regulating in regards to how we're gonna go to sleep. And there are two processes. One is process S and other is process C. So first we're gonna talk about what is process S is. The process S is our body is producing, when we are awake, is producing a compound called adenosine. Adenosine is responsible for us for going to sleep at nighttime. As we remain awake, adenosine picks up, builds up, builds up, builds up as it's see. If you see the graph over here, it's building up, building up, building up, building up. And by the time nighttime kicks in, it is its maximum. It pushes person to go to sleep and allows them to have a proper sleep. And this we call it as a sleep pressure. So this is a normal human mechanism. That's why we're going to sleep at nighttime. What will happen if we take a nap? I'll be discussing about that and we'll be showing what impact it does to our sleep in general. Now let's talk about the second aspect, which is process C. Process C is the circadian rhythm. It is the internal clock, which is regulating our uh, rhythm of our life. So both process C and process S 
work together in tandem and help us to have a proper sleep. And I will explain it to you what it means by that. So this is process S. And in this way, it is nighttime. It's around 11 o'clock. The sleep pressure is really high and the person goes to sleep. And as we are sleeping, the pressure for going to sleep is going down till the morning comes in and the alertness signals goes up. And then we start to develop adenosine back again, 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 until the night comes in. And then we go to sleep right away. And what is the, the process C? Process C is our awakefulness when we are awake. So as you can see, as we are spending through the night, as it, it is going down, the alertness signal is going up and it reaches its maximum when you are about to wake up in the morning. But as we tend to spend our day, our alertness is going down and down and down. And that comes a point, and usually will, you will notice that Right around, around the time of eating lunch or supper time, you will feel more groggier than usual. This is a normal human mechanism of ours that we are actually, our alertness is slightly on the downward side. And then what ends up happening, it picks up back again. And then the sleep pressure kicks in at this time and causes us to go to sleep. So these two factors play a role in regards to our maintaining our sleep rhythm and our sleep cycle, actually. So it's important to know what are the factors which are governing us. One is process S and one is process C. And both twined together gives us, us a sleep rhythm, actually. So now let's talk about what will happen if we take a nap. So as we, as we said, uh, as we um, are waking up around 7 a.m., for example, our adenosine is made in our body. It goes up, 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 and goes to the maximum around nighttime, which is around 11 p.m., pushes us, goes to sleep, and we go to sleep. This graph is indicating this is our sleep pressure. Say, for example, if someone takes a nap around 6 p.m., that sleep pressure, if you're seeing, goes down because you're already using the fuel to go to sleep at nighttime. So what I tell my patients, your sleep is like, I give them an example. So if you're going from um, uh, Springfield to Boston, and if you are having one gallon of gas, would you be able to reach Boston? It's difficult. Same goes for your sleep. To sleep requires sleep pressure. If you take a nap later in the evening or later down the road, and you do it consistently, you are reducing your sleep pressure. When you reduce your sleep pressure, it will lead towards difficulty in initiating the sleep and also lead towards a problem in maintaining sleep. So yes, naps would be sometimes beneficial if they're taken at the right time, which is before 2 p.m., only for a short period of time of 20 minutes, not later than that, not longer than that. And if someone takes it later down the road, they will develop a phenomena called sleep inertia. They, even though they take a nap, they will feel really groggy and they will have a hard time going to sleep and maintaining sleep. Yes, nap can be beneficial and sometimes when you know that you will be traveling or you have a really bad night, but having a regular nap would not be beneficial for certain individuals like such as people who are having insomnia. So that's why it is important to know where the naps play a role and what is the importance on the sleep with the nap. So now, since uh, we know the importance of sleep, what are the things that we have to look out for uh, that can indicate that there is a problem? So if someone is informing or someone has been informed that they're snoring or they are waking up gasping for air or they're stopping breathing, or they've been dozing off while you know, you know, while driving or reading or watching television all the time, and they're having poor concentration, or they're waking up multiple times throughout the night, or feeling that oh my god, they have a very unpleasant sensation in regards to my to my legs that I can't move my I have to move my legs all the time, or they are having all the right ingredients of going to sleep, but still they're not able to sleep at least three times a week then there is a problem. So having these risk factors, having the recognition of this factor should trigger an alarm that there's something wrong with our sleep and we need to look what, how we can fix it. So that takes us to the next step in regards to it, which is insomnia. So as I was talking about the nap, so it's important to know insomnia, what is insomnia is all about. Insomnia is having difficulty 
going to sleep, frequent awakening during the nighttime, or also waking up too early. In the United States, according to CDC, uh, majority of one third of the adult population is getting less than recommended amount of sleep. And for an adult, it's about seven to you know, eight hours of sleep. That's recommended uh, amount of sleep. So what can be the cause of having insomnia? So I'm taking the same thing in regards to it. So napping, if people who are napping, they can lead towards problem and difficulty in initiating sleep and maintaining sleep or having, uh, 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 if they're taking certain things such as uh, nicotine, which is caffeine, which is a stimulant. So if you take a stimulant at nighttime, it will make you more awake rather than going to sleep. So it's very critical to know uh, if people who are smoker and if they're lighting up cigarettes, which I have encountered quite a few times that people generally tend to smoke at nighttime and they're relaxing, actually it is causing them to have a problem to stimulate themselves. And when they're stimulated, it's very hard for them to go to sleep. Same goes for caffeine. Other disorders like such as pain, reflux, arthritis, restless legs, we will be, which we'll be talking uh, uh, also, can lead towards interference of the sleep and life events, losing a family member, having issues with a job and stuff like that, all will trigger insomnia or any significant life event uh, in regards to uh, moving or anything like that will trigger this kind of phenomenon of insomnia. So how to deal with insomnia? The most important thing is to have a, a sleep routine, a pre-sleep routine. So in kids, we actually ask them to have a pattern before they go to sleep. Say, for example, we're asking them, hey, you got to brush your teeth, you got a bedtime story. So as an adult also, we can create an environment to let our mind know, this is my sleep time. This is the time that I'm going to go to sleep. So having a pre-sleep routine tells your brain that, oh, this is my time that I'm about to go to sleep. Having a cool environment, having a dark environment, and keeping the schedule same, which is the most critical thing, because we tend to, to, to change our schedule on weekends and we tend to change our schedule on the weekdays. That's really critical that we get the same amount of sleep every day, regardless of the weekend or the weekday. So sticking to the same schedule is critical important. And how to relax ourselves when we are have bombarded with our life and stresses, learning some breathing exercises, mindful techniques, meditation and guided imagery helps us to relax. What are the treatments? The number, one of the most common treatment is stimulus control. So you have to develop an association with your bed and, and avoid any other activities in the bed apart from going to sleep, uh, such as looking at the clock, which is very common. When we are frustrated, we're not able to see when we look at the clock. So that actually sends a, sends a message to our brain, hey, I'm not able to sleep, what's going on? It, it makes us more anxious. So it's like a vicious circle. Uh, the number one treatment for insomnia is actually cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which means that there we, we develop a habits which are not good for our sleep. And those wrong habits starts to play a role in impacting our sleep that need to be addressed. And cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia actually challenges those unhealthy beliefs and uh, helps to fix our sleep. And, helps to generate a positive thinking in order to help us to go to sleep. Yes, medications are also an option, but the most important thing is CBTI, which is underutilized. And that's the number one treatment actually for insomnia rather than a pill to fix a problem. So what ends up happening when we are laying in the bed, we're not able to sleep. It's like a vicious circle. We see the clock, oh my God, it's two. I have to get up in the morning and I have not, uh, what I'm gonna do in the morning, how I'm gonna go to sleep, how I'm gonna do my work, that cycle, starts to frustrate. And when, when we are frustrated, we are actually stimulating our mind. And that vicious cycle continues and prevents us from going to sleep. So removing the clock, removing the electronics, uh, going away from, from avoiding any stimulus in regards to that keeps us awake, help us to calm down and help us to maintain a good quality of sleep. The other uh, uh, sleep disorder, which we're gonna be talking about impacts of sleep is restless leg. It's an overwhelming desire uh, to move to, uh, to move our legs at nighttime that can cause uh, uh, us to, to, to move our legs. Uh, and this generally tends to happen uh, late in the evening. According to the National Institute of Neurological Disorder, approximately seven to 10% of US population actually suffers from that. It generally happens at rest and it, 
is relieved by, by movement and tends to happen mostly around in the evening time. And you will notice people who have been, you know, who are traveling for long distance, sitting in the car or sitting in an airplane, they will start feeling that there's an urge to move their legs. There's a creepy crawly sensation. That's an indication that they have in restless eyes. Same phenomena generally tends to happen at nighttime and triggers us and difficulty in going to sleep and maintaining sleep. It wakes us up from the sleep and, and, and plays a role in regarding, um, in regarding going to initiate a sleep back up again. So what are the reasons that, uh, that we develop restless legs? So iron deficiency, which is very common, can cause that. Certain medication that over-the-counter Benadryl, which we use it for sleep actually, cause a reverse phenomena and cause restless legs to happen actually. People who are on dialysis, alcohol and nicotine has been shown. And in, in pregnant patients uh, in the last trimester can cause them to have restless legs and neuropathy. So how to treat restless legs? The number one treatment for restless legs is to figure out what is the underlying causes. So say, for example, I have encountered a lot of patients that who are smoking at nighttime and they're feeling, oh my God, I have an urge to move my legs. So first of all, we need to take out that component of, of, their, of their cause. So if we treat the underlying cause, it fixes the underlying problem. Lifestyle changes, iron supplementation, and there are medications available if they're truly having um, a restless leg. There are medications which we can give it to them, uh, like uh, Merapax and uh, uh, things like that, which can assist in patient in uh, reducing the symptoms of uh, restless leg syndrome. So this plays a role in restless leg, plays a role in regarding initiating sleep, and, and also can play a role in, in, in regarding maintaining sleep. So they can wake up in the middle of the night and have symptoms and cannot go back to sleep. So keep an eye on regards to if, you, if someone is having those symptoms, they need to reach out and, and, and uh, get it addressed in regards to because it's playing a role in their sleep. The, the other thing, uh, the other disorder, which, uh, which is very common and it is very commonly underdiagnosed is obstructive sleep apnea. What is obstructive sleep apnea? It is, it is briefly repeated uh, 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 stopping of breathing during when we are sleeping. And it presents itself in the form of uh, you know, insomnia because they're stopping breathing so many times that they're waking up again and again, or they're having excessive daytime sleepiness. So they're so tired because the entire night that they slept, they were not able to sleep properly. And then they wake up and they feel really groggy. And uh, that's uh, according to National Sleep, uh, Sleep Foundation, approximately five to 20% of the adult population actually suffers from obstructive sleep apnea. And what are the causes of that? The number one cause is that you would hear that, that indicates that someone is having that, is snoring, feeling fatigued and tired, having uh, that the partner would notice, hey, you know, we, I noticed that you were stopping breathing at nighttime or they will wake up gasping for air. And yes, weight does play a role in regards to uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So if someone who's having uh, sleep apnea and they're, they're on the, uh, their, their BMI is on the higher side, yes, it can play a role in, in, in development of obstructive sleep apnea also. So if, if someone who's having these symptoms, they're snorting, they're tired, uh, and they're, they're feeling they're waking up gasping for air or they're choking or their partner's noting they're snoring, they're, they're, they're stopping breathing, it's time for them to you know reach out to uh, uh, to, to a medical provider to make sure that they're not having sleep apnea. So how do we treat sleep apnea? So the first is to diagnose sleep apnea. Sleep apnea can be diagnosed. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, you know, a few ways of diagnosing it. We can do home sleep studies and we can do in-lab sleep study depending upon the clinical uh, scenarios that we are, uh, you know, we're dealing with. We can do it in, in, in patients' home and diagnose uh, sleep apnea uh, depending upon how many times they're stopping breathing uh, when they are sleeping. And it also has a, a degree of severity, mild, moderate, and severe, depending upon how many times they're stopping breathing at nighttime. So in the number one treatment, when we find someone, oh, someone is having sleep apnea. So mild is from five to 15 times in one hour is considered mild. 15 to 30 is moderate. Above 30 times in one hour is considered severe sleep apnea. So treatment options are continuous airway positive pressure. So what I tell my patients, it's like a leaf grower which is very sophisticated that it senses how many times you're stopping breathing, it delivers pressure. It's not an oxygen, it's just a pressure to keep the airway open so you don't stop breathing when you're sleeping. And nowadays, machine is sophisticated enough, they sense it, how, many you, how much you're stopping breathing and deliver the pressure accordingly. That is one modality and the number one modality of treatment. 
Two is uh, uh, oral device, which is mandibular advancement device. It's a special device which pulls the low jaw forward so you don't stop breathing when you're sleeping. Weight loss plays a role. Uh, sleep apnea gets worse on, uh, on, on the, on when we sleep on the back. So sleeping on the side would not be a bad option, uh, depending on the severity of the disease. And also surgery, which is another option, which involves the elevation of the upper palate and taking out the uvula to make sure the airway is opened up so that you can breathe. So these are the options of treatment that one should know that these are out there in regards to treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. The other uh, uh, option in regards to that now is uh, disorder that we encounter, uh, which is not very common, but we do see it. It's called uh, narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is excessive daytime sleepiness. It's associated with sleep attacks, sleep paralysis, hallucinations, and also a component of cataplexy, which means all of a sudden, or due to certain emotional, positive emotional response, they will, they will lose their muscle control which is known as cataplexy. It is diagnosed in one in 2000 to 2000 individual. Majority of times it's very undiagnosed disorder. And it is happening uh, due to a lack of a com uh, compound in our brain called hypocritin. Hypocritin is responsible for controlling. Uh, it's a switch on and off mechanism for our dream sleep. And in, in, in narcoleptic patients, this compound is deficient. So they're having a faulty switch and that's why they're going into excessive daytime sleepiness during the daytime. It has a genetic disposition and its, its diagnosis requires some sleep testing, also requires medications, which uh, we do in a sleep lab and certain medications are given to keep your, 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 uh, your or to individual awake uh, so that they don't go to sleep uh, during the daytime. And there's some lifestyle modifications that are required because uh, for patients who have narcoleptic, uh, can also benefit from, these are the situation where a nap, a short nap would not be a bad idea for patients who are having narcolepsy to help them uh, to live a normal life actually. So this is part of the, uh, one of the disorders that we need to make sure that we keep an eye in regards to that. Now we come on to the, uh, to the sleep and the pandemic. We are dealing with this right now and it has, uh, it is impacting all of us actually. As we know, as in the beginning, I told you that sleep has an impact on our physical health, like blood pressure, cardiovascular wise, obesity wise, also impacts our mental health. So our sleep is disrupted by anxiety. If someone is anxious, it will be very hard for them to go to sleep. And our pandemic is causing people to getting, you know, developing depression, social isolation. People are using more screen time right now since they are at home or not at work or they're working remotely. It is creating more of a stress related fatigue. Their routine is being changed. They're not following the normal pattern of their work. And they're more stressed from the work because of the type of the work is being done right now, the working from home. So all accumulating impacts are sleep. So yes, the, it's the uncertainty uh, of what we are dealing with definitely impact the sleep. So it's really critical to pay attention to how we're dealing with that. Uh, so sleep, as we know, enhances our mood. A proper healthy sleep improves our mental health. It improves, as we know from the testing, that we did the brain test to see how our critical thinking is. It is governed by that. So if you have a proper sleep, you would actually do able to do critical thinking. It also, studies have shown it boosts your immune system. So having a good night's sleep during a pandemic also helps you to maintain your immune system. So what we need to do is to keep the schedule same. This is the key. Sticking to the same schedule every day is really important. Reserve the bed only for sleep, not for any other activity. Using electronics or television, avoid that. Go out there in the morning, see the sunlight, you know, avoid because people are working from home, they're trying to take naps, avoid that because it destroys your nighttime sleep. Stay active as possible as you can. We do practical social kindness that never, that never uh, is not a bad thing at all, actually. Utilizing relaxation because it's making us anxious how we're dealing with our surrounding. Uh, paying attention to our diet, and if still you're having issues, would not be a bad idea to contact uh, any sleep provider. So be practice at uh, base date, 
Uh, and this is our website uh, where we function. We had a multidisciplinary team from adults to kids. We do all the services in regards to that. And so if you have any concerns or if you have any issues, you're more than welcome to go to our website and check out. And uh, uh, if you need any assistance from our end, we'll be more than happy to help you guys out. Now I would like to open for any questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Saeed. I really enjoyed that. And I especially like the part about kindness, but I thought you did a great job covering the topic really well. And um, I hope our attendees feel the same way. In a few, uh, we'll give everyone a few minutes to um, type in any questions that they may have for Dr. Saeed. And I appreciate the fact that you covered COVID and sleep too, definitely uh, a lot of anxiety with all of us regarding that. Uh, and I think this is, it's a natural process. We, this, we are a human beings and we are dealing with this from right, left and center and it impacts our sleep. And uh, um, the way I see it, uh, sticking to the same schedule is really, really, really critical. Because uh, I tell my patients, sleep is a habit. We create certain habits which interfere with the sleep and we create good habits, we create bad habits. And when we start to inculcate bad habits, it starts to impact the sleep. And then mm -hmm. it turns it's a vicious circle and lead towards more anxiety, more feeling down, and it's a vicious process. So having good night sleep is really critical. Are there um, any um, over-the-counter or what, well, I guess, what are your thoughts about over-the-counter over medications for sleep? So uh, generally, um, um, I'm, I would suggest that melatonin is the only compound uh, which is produced in our body. So if someone has having uh, a hard time going to sleep or they're having uh, issues in regards to uh, certain uh, rhythm disorders, then yes, uh, melatonin can be used, uh, but not at very high doses around uh, one to two milligrams, up to three milligrams. That's a maximum dose. So 30 minutes before they go to sleep, because um, uh, the number one thing is sleep hygiene. It's we try to look for quick fixes. Actually, it's not bad. If we fix the root cause of the problem, we're actually fixing the problem. And that's where the sleep hygiene, stimulus control, relaxation techniques, keeping the bed only meant for sleeping would also help. And the number one treatment, which actually we do not pay attention or has not been uh, talked about is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It is actually the number one treatment for insomnia. Yes, when someone is traveling, when someone is um, having a bad night or once in a while, yeah, melatonin would not be a bad idea to try because it's produced in our body and it actually regulates our sleep mechanism. So that would be something to try to help us uh, to go to sleep, actually. Mm, very good. Thank you. And so conversely, what about the Red Bulls and all these other things that are supposed to keep us awake? You know, when I'm thinking about your dry, drowsy driving slide. So we are actually self-medicating ourselves. So if we are not having a good quality sleep, so that's where the problem kicks in. So are we patching up the, the symptom or are we uh, addressing the root cause of the problem? So by drinking caffeine, or by drinking Red Bull, we are actually patching up the symptom, but not going for the root cause of the problem. The root cause can be they're having insomnia, that they're not able to sleep, but they want to function during the daytime. So that's why they're chugging up the coffee, they're chugging up the, you know, the, the caffeine or the Red Bulls in regards to that. So we need to fix the root cause. If we fix the root cause, then the patient will not require a Red Bull or that. Or someone is having it, excessive daytime sleepiness due to obstructive sleep apnea. And if we are not treating the obstructive sleep apnea, then we are actually, uh, they're trying to self-medicate themselves to keep themselves awake so that they can perform their job. So if we treat the root cause problem, we will actually fix the excessive daytime sleepiness. I will give you an example. Um, I was with a patient actually today. Uh, he was actually drinking, no kidding, uh, quite a, a lot, uh, like nearly two pots of coffee a day. 
And he was having oh, wow. really bad sleep apnea, severe sleep apnea. We started him on treatment and his requirement of caffeine has gone down to one to two cup a day now. Oh, wow. Well, so you're if you fix the root cause of the problem. So say, for example, if someone is having insomnia, they're not sleeping. So definitely they will be tired and sleepy during the daytime. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to do take uh, stuff to keep themselves awake. So that's yes. fixing the path. They're fixing the symptoms, but not root, fixing the root cause of the problem. So if you fix the insomnia, or if they are having obstructive sleep apnea, which is causing them to be really truly sleepy, or they're having restless legs because they're not able to sleep better. And that's why they're so groggy in the day when, when in the morning when they're waking up. So if you fix that problem, you're actually reducing the requirement of these things in the morning time. Because mm. what so, coffee thank, does, thank it, 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 actually, it actually works against uh, the adenosine, which is responsible for going to sleep. So it's functioning against it. So it's, yes, definitely would wake you up, but it is not actually fixing the baseline problem, the original issue, which is causing the person and, uh, to be excessive and to have a problem with their wakefulness during the daytime. Mm, sure. Thank you for that. Um, I, um, if anyone has any questions, they can type them in the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, there was another question about CPAPs. Uh, I guess there's an understanding that they have advanced quite a bit. I guess the, the, they might be a little bit smaller or a little different. In yeah, no, there are a variety of CPAPs. Uh, like, uh, uh, yes, machines uh, before, you know, um, in 90s and 80s and early 2000s, they used to be really big machines. Now they're really small and uh, they do not make any noises. Uh, and uh, they're easy to be, you know, to you know, to to place around. It, it's like a white noise; doesn't create any much higher noise in regards to. There are also travel machines available that you can actually take it with you, and you can travel along with that. So yes, uh, machines are much more smaller, and there are different modalities of treatment available in form of CPAP is one type of treatment. Um, there is BiPAP, which CPAP is like continuous airway pressure, whereas BiPAP is different pressure when you inhale. And when you exhale, so this is second treatment modality for PAP therapy is BiPAP. And there are other treatment modalities are there, adaptive servo ventilation, IVAPs. So we have different other forms of machines which are available to, give, to deal with different kinds of scenarios, depending upon what we are dealing with. Mm, thank you. Um, there's a question about breathing in relate. Um, where can we learn about breathing exercises and mindfulness techniques? And does that, does the breathe, does breathing exercises help with ins insomnia? Yeah. I, I personally uh, uh, use an app which is developed by Department of Veterans Affairs uh, called CBTI Coach. Uh, it's available on, uh, it's a free app. Uh, which is uh, help in patients in regarding uh, learning the techniques for uh, developing breathing exercises also helps to shutting their mind down when they're having a hard time to shut their mind down. So if you go on your app store or you go into your um, place like uh, uh, for Google phone, you can go to Android phone, uh, search CBTI coach. It is an app that will help you to learn. Uh, and when you go into tools to quiet your mind down, how to learn relaxation technique, how to learn breathing exercises. So it's a free app, which is given by uh, VA. Uh, they have developed a software, like an app in regards to it. And I te tell my patient to use that because it helps them to get control and helps them to learn uh, certain things. And if despite of that, they're not getting help, there are specialists, which are CBTI specialists, which will help them to teach them and guide them how to do those kind of things to, to plow through this uh, issues in regards to learning how for meditation and uh, uh, breathing exercise also. So there's a tool and there is a person that can also teach you who does a CBTI, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia actually. Excellent, that's a great tip. Uh, what's your feeling about white noise machines? Yeah, it's okay. It's if someone is is uh, uh, it's it's a lullaby for them to to have a noise. Uh, 
uh, generally, you know, each individual is different. If, if if someone wants to have a noise, and there are quite a few people that would require some kind of noise in the background, a light noise, well, okay. If this is a lullaby for them to go to sleep, I'm okay with that because idea is to make sure that they can go to sleep and maintain their sleep. So if this is helping them and it's not giving them an, or stimulating them or waking them up, Yes, they can try that to help them to go to sleep and and, and initiate sleep. That's that's not a bad idea, as long as it's not stimulating them. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question, are snoring, stop breathing, et cetera, causes or symptoms of apnea? So uh, snoring can be indicative of sleep apnea. Snoring can be uh, 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 on its own, but it can also be associated with obstructive sleep apnea. And when it is associated, snoring associated with stopping breathing and also associated with waking up gasping for air, it raises a red flag that something is going on. And I will explain it to you why. Because if one is stopping breathing, the body defense mechanism is to get air. So when we want to get air, what we'll do and if you if the sleep apnea happens due to narrowness at the back of the throat, if the back of the throat is uh, is getting narrowed up, then what ends up happening? The body says, "Hey, I need oxygen." So you start to open up your mouth to try to engulf air. When you try to engulf air, the air passes through the bigger air passages, causes the vibration, causes snoring to happen. And if they're truly they're having stopping breathing, the partner will notice that, "Hey, you were stopping breathing," and it tends to happen most commonly when they're sleeping on their back. And the partner will nudge them, hey, hey, come on, uh, turn around because you're stopping breathing. Or they will wake up gasping for air because they're choking up because of the narrowness of the back of the throat and wake them up. So this, these are the symptoms of indication that something is growing or brewing in the background, which is obstructive sleep apnea, which is causing them to behave like that, actually. So these are an indication that something is wrong. And what something is wrong is, is sleep apnea, which is presenting in this sh shape or form to indicate that the patient is getting deprived of, of the oxygen actually at nighttime. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for all your information. Very helpful. My concern is that once I wake up at 4 a.m., I can't fall back to sleep. That's a very common and very <laughs> important question. <laughs> Actually, the answer is in the question. And what I'm saying is that, look, you're looking at the time. And that is triggering your phenomena. Um, so you look at the time. As I said, looking at the clock is not a beneficial thing. Yes, you can set an alarm. The first thing when you were about to wake up in the morning, that's fine. But if you wake up in the middle of the night and you look at the clock, what signal are you telling, telling your brain? Oh, my God, I'm up again. Oh, I'm going to get up in the morning. It's nearly morning time. How I'm going to go back to sleep. That vicious circle kicks in. So avoiding the clock, please not to look at the clock is number one thing. But doing some relaxation technique while you're in the bed would not be bad. You can remain in the bed for approximately 20 minutes by doing these exercises, trying to calm yourself down. If you're not able to sleep within 20 minutes, please leave the bed. Bed is only meant for sleeping and being with your partner, not for laying down. If you're not able to sleep, leave the bed, do something really boring, such as reading something which you hate to read. And if you start feeling sleepy, come back to the bed and avoid the clock. Because the more you see the clock, then you have set an alarm in your brain then that this is the, my time to wake up. So you don't need an alarm. You will wake up the same time every night. So... Sometimes I tell my patient in order to break that cycle that you have already set an alarm in your brain to wake up around four, you need to get an alarm for a couple of days only around 3.30 to break that cycle of waking up every time, same time, because you have set an alarm as internal clock. So as we said, in the beginning, I said there are two clocks, external and internal. The internal clock has an alarm now of four. So we're trying to break that cycle of internal clock so you know, setting alarm for two days around 3.30 to break that cycle and then also making sure uh, um, only to remain in bed for 20 minutes, de doing some breathing exercises. What I generally suggest patients if they're having a hard time shut their mind down, 
Uh, they can write a journal actually before they go to bed and write down all their concerns, their worries, and write down the solution to the problems. Because at four o'clock when you wake up, you will start thinking about those things that you're gonna do the next day. But if you've already done your homework before you go to bed, it will help you to, to remain calm and tell your brain, hey, stop. I do not need to worry about those things. I've already taken care of it. So this sets a tone in regards to maintaining your sleep also. And it also depends on whether someone is waking up uh, because of sleep apnea. They're waking up because they're short of, or like they're stopping breathing that is waking them up. Or uh, they're having restless legs that is waking them up. So history will be really critical to figure out whether they're having not any background information, which is causing them to wake up around four o'clock also. So mm -hmm. that will be my, my answer. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question. Any comment on frequent myoclonic jerking? How do you reduce it? I am uh, majority of times, this is a neurological question. I know that my introduction was made as a, a, a neurologist. I actually, I'm an internist, <laughs> not oh. a, a neurologist. Well, that was my error. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So uh, dealing with that is, is, is uh, uh, depending upon if someone is having untreated sleep apnea also trying to make sure that they're not having, uh, are they truly having that or they're having sleep apnea also, which is causing them to, to have uh, leg jerks, which is very common. They jerk their leg a lot because they're struggling to breathe. And sometimes they can have, uh, of, um, because of untreated sleep apnea, uh, that can lead towards this kind of phenomenon. So yes, uh, it has to be uh, delved into detail why they're having it. One of the costs can be that, so that needs to be addressed so that that doesn't happen. Excellent, thank you. Um, there was, oh, uh, one person is asking if this event will be available later to watch. They weren't able to log on at six. And yes, we will be, uh, we are recording the event and it will be available on baystatehealth.org website after the event in just a couple of days. And uh, we're just waiting a couple more minutes to see if there's any other questions coming in. Oh, there's uh, somebody said thank you with four exclamation points. So thank you, Dr. Saeed. Um, You're welcome, anytime. Uh, we appreciate your time and your expertise and uh, really excellent tips and information. And um, I thank you again for providing this um, event for our community. Well, you're welcome anytime. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, we are a multidisciplinary team at Bay State. We actually take care of kids, adults, everyone. So if you have any issues, uh, we are more than happy to see you, to help you, and to guide you. Uh, so we are there to help you guys out. So feel free to reach out to us, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me.